On the day following the events last related, as Leonard Holt was standing at the door of the shop, his master having just been called out by some important business, a man in the dress of a watchman, with a halberd in his hand, approached him and inquired if he was Mr. Blundell's apprentice. Before returning an answer, Leonard looked hard at the newcomer and thought he had never beheld so ill-favored a person before. Every feature in his face was distorted. His mouth was twisted on one side, his nose on the other, while his right eyebrow was elevated more than an inch above the left, added to which he squinted intolerably, had a long fell of straight sandy hair, a sandy beard and mustache, and a complexion of the color of brick dust. An ugly dog, muttered Leonard to himself, as he finished his scrutiny, what can he want with me? Suppose I should be Mr. Blundell's apprentice, he added, aloud, what then, friend? Your master has a beautiful daughter, has he not? asked the ill-favored watchman. I answer no idle questions, rejoined Leonard, coldly. As you please, returned the other, in an offended tone. A plan to carry her off has accidentally come to my knowledge. But, since incivility is all I am likely to get for my pains in coming to acquaint you with it, Ian find it out yourself. Hold, cried the apprentice, detaining him, I meant no offense. Step indoors for a moment. We can converse there more freely. The watchman, who, notwithstanding his ill looks, appeared to be a good-natured fellow, was easily appeased. Following the apprentice into the shop, on the promise of a handsome reward, he instantly commenced his relation. Last night, he said, I was keeping watch at the door of Mr. Brackley, a saddler in Aldermanbury, whose house having been attacked by the pestilence is now shut up, when I observed two persons, rather singularly attired, pass me. Both were dressed like old men, but neither their gait nor tone of voice corresponded with their garb. It must have been the Earl of Rochester and his companion, remarked Leonard. You are right, replied the other for I afterwards heard one of them addressed by that title. But to proceed. I was so much struck by the strangeness of their appearance that I left my post for a few minutes and followed them. They halted beneath a gateway, and, as they conversed together very earnestly and in a loud tone, I could distinctly hear what they said. One of them, the stoutest of the two, complained bitterly of the indignities he had received from Mr. Blondel's apprentice, meaning you, of course, averring that nothing but his devotion to his companion had induced him to submit to them, and affirming, with many tremendous oaths, that he would certainly cut the young man's throat the very first opportunity. He shall not want it then, replied Leonard contemptuously, neither shall he lack a second application of my cudgel when we meet. But what of his companion? What did he say? He laughed heartily at the other's complaints, returned the watchman, and told him to make himself easy, for he should soon have his revenge. Tomorrow night, he said, we will carry off Amabel, in spite of the apprentice or her father, and, as I am equally indebted with yourself to the latter, we will pay off old scores with him. How do they intend to effect their purpose? demanded Leonard. That I cannot precisely tell, replied the watchman. All I could hear was that they meant to enter the house by the backyard about midnight. And now, if you will make it worth my while, I will help you to catch them in their own trap. Hum, said Leonard. What is your name? Gregory Swindlehurst, replied the other. To help me, you must keep watch with me tonight, rejoined Leonard. Can you do so? I see nothing to hinder me, provided I am paid for my trouble, replied Gregory. I will find someone to take my place at Mr. Brackley's. At what hour shall I come? Soon after ten, said Leonard. Be at the shop door, and I will let you in. Count upon me, rejoined Gregory, a smile of satisfaction illumining his ill-favored countenance. Shall I bring a comrade with me? I know a trusty fellow who would like the job. 
If Lord Rochester should have his companions with him, assistance will be required. True, replied Leonard. Is your comrade a watchman, like yourself? He is an old soldier who has been lately employed to keep guard over infected houses, replied Gregory. We must take care his lordship does not overreach us. If he gets into the house without my knowledge, I will forgive him, replied the apprentice. He won't get into it without mine, muttered Gregory, significantly. But do you not mean to warn Mistress Amabel of her danger? I shall consider of it, replied the apprentice. At this moment Mr. Blondel entered the shop, and Leonard, feigning to supply his companion with a small packet of grocery, desired him, in a low tone, to be punctual to his appointment, and dismissed him. In justice to the apprentice, it must be stated that he had no wish for concealment, but was most anxious to acquaint his master with the information he had just obtained, and was only deterred from doing so by a dread of the consequences it might produce to Amabel. The evening passed off much as usual. The family assembled at prayer, and Blaze, whose shoulders still ached with the chastisement he had received, eyed the apprentice with sullen and revengeful looks. Patience, too, was equally angry, and her indignation was evinced in a manner so droll, that at another season it would have drawn a smile from Leonard. Supper over, Amabel left the room. Leonard followed her, and overtook her on the landing of the stairs. Amabel, he said, I have received certain intelligence that the Earl of Rochester will make another attempt to enter the house, and carry you off tonight. Oh! When will he cease from persecuting me? she cried. When you cease to encourage him, replied the apprentice, bitterly. I do not encourage him, Leonard, she rejoined, and to prove that I do not, I will act in any way you think proper tonight. If I could trust you, said Leonard, you might be of the greatest service in convincing the Earl that his efforts are fruitless. You may trust me, she rejoined. Well, then, returned Leonard, when the family have retired to rest, come downstairs, and I will tell you what to do. Hastily promising compliance, Amabel disappeared, and Leonard ran down the stairs, at the foot of which he encountered Mrs. Blundell. What is the matter? she asked. Nothing, nothing, replied the apprentice, evasively. That will not serve my turn, she rejoined. Something, I am certain, troubles you, though you do not choose to confess it. Heaven grant your anxiety is not occasioned by aught relating to that wicked Earl of Rochester. I cannot sleep in my bed for thinking of him. I noticed that you followed Amabel out of the room. I hope you do not suspect anything. Do not question me further, madam, I entreat, returned the apprentice. Whatever I may suspect, I have taken all needful precautions. Rest easy, and sleep soundly, if you can. All will go well. I shall never rest easy, Leonard, rejoined Mrs. Blundell, till you are wedded to my daughter. Then, indeed, I shall feel happy. My poor child, I am sure, is fully aware how indiscreet her conduct has been, and when this noble libertine desists from annoying her, or rather, when he is effectually shut out, we may hope for a return of her regard for you. It is a vain hope, madam, replied Leonard, there will be no such return. I neither expect it nor desire it. Have you ceased to love her? asked Mrs. Blundell, in surprise. Ceased to love her, echoed Leonard, fiercely. Would I had done so, would I could do so. I love her too well, too well. And repeating the words to himself with great bitterness, he hurried away. His passion has disturbed his brain, sighed Mrs. Blundell, as she proceeded to her chamber. I must try to reason him into calmness tomorrow. 
Half an hour after this, the grocer retired for the night, and Leonard, who had gone to his own room, cautiously opened the door and repaired to the shop. On the way he met Amabel. She looked pale as death and trembled so violently that she could scarcely support herself. I hope you do not mean to use any violence towards the Earl, Leonard, she said in a supplicating voice. He will never repeat his visit, rejoined the apprentice, gloomily. Your looks terrify me, cried Amabel, gazing with great uneasiness at his stern and determined countenance. I will remain by you. He will depart at my bidding. Did he depart at your bidding before? demanded Leonard, sarcastically. He did not, I grant, she replied, more supplicatingly than before. But do not harm him, for mercy's sake, do not take my life sooner. I alone have offended you. The apprentice made no reply, but, unlocking a box, took out a brace of large horse pistols and a sword, and thrust them into his girdle. You do not mean to use those murderous weapons, cried Amabel. It depends on circumstances, replied Leonard. Force must be met by force. Nay, then, she rejoined, the affair assumes too serious an aspect to be trifled with. I will instantly alarm my father. Do so, retorted Leonard, and he will cast you off forever. Better that, than be the cause of bloodshed, she returned. But is there nothing I can do to prevent this fatal result? Yes, replied Leonard. Make your lover understand he is unwelcome to you. Dismiss him forever. On that condition, he shall depart unharmed and freely. I will do so, she rejoined. Nothing more was then said. Amabel seated herself and kept her eyes fixed on Leonard, who, avoiding her regards, stationed himself near the door. By and by a slight tap was heard without, and the apprentice cautiously admitted Gregory Swindlehurst and his comrade. The latter was habited like the other watchman, in a blue night rail, and was armed with a halberd. He appeared much stouter, much older, and, so far as could be discovered of his features, for a large handkerchief muffled his face, much uglier, if that were possible, than his companion. He answered to the name of Bernard Boutefu. They had no sooner entered the shop, than Leonard locked the door. Who are these persons? asked Amabel, rising in great alarm. Two watchmen whom I have hired to guard the house, replied Leonard. We are come to protect you, fair mistress, said Gregory, and, if need be, to cut the Earl of Rochester's throat. Oh heavens, exclaimed Amabel. Ghost of Tarquin, cried Boutefu, will teach him to break into the houses of quiet citizens, and attempt to carry off their daughters against their will. By the soul of Dick Whittington, Lord Mayor of London. We'll maul and mangle him. Silence. Bernard Boutefu, interposed Gregory. You frighten Mistress Amabel by your strange oaths. I should be sorry to do that, replied Boutefu, I only wish to show my zeal for her. Don't be afraid of the Earl of Rochester, fair mistress. With all his audacity, he won't dare to enter the house when he finds we are there. Is it your pleasure that we should thrust a halberd through his body, or lodge a bullet in his brain? asked Gregory, appealing to Amabel. Touch him not, I beseech you, she rejoined. Leonard, I have your promise that, if I can prevail upon him to depart, you will not molest him. You have, he replied. You hear that, she observed to the watchman. We are all obedience, said Gregory. Bless your tender heart, cried Boutefu, we would not pain you for the world. A truce to this, said Leonard. Come to the yard, we will wait for him there. 
I will go with you, cried Amabel. If any harm should befall him, I should never forgive myself. Remember what I told you, rejoined Leonard, sternly, it depends upon yourself whether he leaves the house alive. Heed him not, whispered Gregory. I and my comrade will obey no one but you. Amabel could not repress an exclamation of surprise. What are you muttering, Sarah? demanded Leonard, angrily. Only that the young lady may depend on our fidelity, replied Gregory. There can be no offense in that. Come with us, he whispered to Amabel. The latter part of his speech escaped Leonard, but the tone in which it was uttered was so significant that Amabel, who began to entertain new suspicions, hesitated. You must come, said Leonard, seizing her hand. The fault be his, not mine, murmured Amabel, as she suffered herself to be drawn along. The party then proceeded noiselessly towards the yard. On the way, Amabel felt a slight pressure on her arm, but, afraid of alarming Leonard, she made no remark. The back door was opened, and the little group stood in the darkness. They had not long to wait. Before they had been in the yard five minutes, a noise was heard of footsteps and muttered voices in the entry. This was followed by a sound like that occasioned by fastening a rope ladder against the wall, and the next moment two figures were perceived above it. After dropping the ladder into the yard, these persons, the foremost of whom the apprentice concluded was the Earl of Rochester, descended. They had no sooner touched the ground than Leonard, drawing his pistols, advanced towards them. You are my prisoner, my lord, he said, in a stern voice, and shall not depart with life, unless you pledge your word never to come hither again on the same errand. Betrayed, cried the Earl laying his hand upon his sword. Resistance is in vain, my lord, rejoined Leonard. I am better armed than yourself. Will nothing bribe you to silence, fellow, cried the earl. I will give you a thousand pounds, if you will hold your tongue, and conduct me to my mistress. I can scarcely tell what stays my hand, returned Leonard, in a furious tone but I will hold no further conversation with you. Amabel is present, and will give you your final dismissal herself. If I receive it from her own lips, replied the Earl, I will instantly retire, but not otherwise. Amabel, said Leonard in a low tone to her, you hear what is said. Fulfill your promise. Do so, cried a voice, which she instantly recognized, in her ear, I am near you. Ah, she exclaimed. Do you hesitate, cried the apprentice, sternly. My lord, said Amabel, in a faint voice, I must pray you to retire, your efforts are in vain. I will never fly with you. That will not suffice, whispered Leonard you must tell him you no longer love him. Hear me, pursued Amabel, you who present yourself as Lord Rochester, I entertain no affection for you, and never wish to behold you again. Enough, cried Leonard. Admirable, whispered Gregory. Nothing could be better. Well, cried the supposed Earl, since I no longer hold a place in your affections, it would be idle to pursue the matter further. Heaven be praised, there are other damsels quite as beautiful, though not so cruel. Farewell forever, Amabel. So saying he mounted the ladder, and, followed by his companion, disappeared on the other side. He is gone, said Leonard, and I hope forever. Now let us return to the house. I am coming, rejoined Amabel. Let him go, whispered Gregory. The ladder is still upon the wall, we will climb it. And as the apprentice moved towards the house, he tried to drag her in that direction. 
I cannot, will not fly thus, she cried. What is the matter? exclaimed Leonard, suddenly turning. Further disguise is useless, replied the supposed Gregory Swindlehurst. I am the Earl of Rochester. The other was a counterfeit. Ah, exclaimed Leonard, rushing towards them and placing a pistol against the breast of his mistress. Have I been duped? But it is not yet too late to retrieve my error. Move a foot further, my lord, and do you, Amabel, attempt to fly with him, and I fire. You cannot mean this, cried Rochester. Raise your hand against the woman you love? Against the woman who forgets her duty, and the libertine who tempts her, the arm that is raised is that of justice, replied Leonard. Stir another footstep, and I fire. As he spoke, his arms were suddenly seized by a powerful grasp from behind, and, striking the pistols from his hold, the earl snatched up Amabel in his arms, and, mounting the ladder, made good his retreat. A long and desperate struggle took place between Leonard and his assailant, who was no other than Pillicotti, in his assumed character of Bernard Boutafu. But notwithstanding the superior strength of the bully, and the advantage he had taken of the apprentice, he was worsted in the end. Leonard had no sooner extricated himself, than, drawing his sword, he would have passed it through Pillicotti's body, if the latter had not stayed his hand by offering to tell him where he would find his mistress, provided his life were spared. Where has the earl taken her? cried Leonard, scarcely able to articulate from excess of passion. He meant to take her to St. Paul's, to the vaults below the cathedral, to avoid pursuit, replied Pillicotti. I have no doubt you will find her there. I will go there instantly in search, cried Leonard, rushing up the ladder.